This episode is brought to you by the Chronicle Protocol, a cost-efficient, transparent, and decentralized oracle. Chronicle has developed a next-generation oracle primitive called Scribe, which reduces oracle gas fees on L1s and L2s by over 60%. You'll hear more about Chronicle later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to uh, another episode of Empire. We've got Ram, CEO of co and co-founder of Lumina Wealth, joining us. Ram, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. Big fan of the show. Glad to hear it. So it was funny. So we were talking earlier uh, before we recorded about kind of frauds within frauds and the BlockWorks website. Someone created this duplicate BlockWorks website and put up this fake news story. But to do that, they had to do another thing and frauds within frauds. And we are using this episode to talk about a potential other fraud within a fraud, which is Genesis, DCG, and everything that is kind of unfolding as we see it today. I think a lot of eyes are on this SBF trial right now, but you've been shedding a lot of light on Twitter on what's happening with DCG, Genesis, Barry Silbert, and the like. So maybe you could just set up this conversation with uh, the cast of characters, basically. And, and, and really what I'm curious about is like, who owns what and how does the money flow? And then we can drive this conversation forward. Perfect. So it starts off with a digital currency group founded by Barry Silver, you know, it's a blue chip storied institution and DCG has a number of subsidiaries, the main character there being Genesis, right? And Genesis is a prime broker. They extend loans against digital assets. DCG also owns Grayscale, which was the, and is the issuer of Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, GBTC. DCG also owns Coindesk and has investments in dozens of startup companies. Cool. Perfect. Easy. So take us into when you first started to get kind of spidey senses that this was not unfolding in the right way. Sure. Well, I'll start by saying, like, I'm a creature of the financial crisis. I graduated school in the 2001 recession. And the reason why that matters is that a lot of what we see crypto doing today is speed running history. And what we saw in 2008 was non-banks pretending to be banks. So you had companies like General Electric funding via commercial paper markets and borrowing short and funding these long duration assets and investment banks were doing the same thing. And so that was really the pattern match to the present day. So Celsius and BlockFi and Genesis, I was looking at that, I said, oh, this is the pattern is back. It's non-banks pretending to be banks. And this pattern happens roughly every 10 years, by the way. It happened in 2001, too. So that was once I was primed to spot this, uh, if you will. And uh, previous to Lumina, I was the head of crypto at Crosser, which is a bank. And so in that capacity, I wanted to extend loans on digital assets. Except when you're a bank, you have FDIC insurance. You've got a lender of last resort. You've got the risk management systems. You've got the counterparty risk systems in place to do it responsibly. And we couldn't find any good loans to make because of just the weaknesses uh, in the underwriting and not being able to, quote, perfect your security interest when you make a loan. And uh, so that that's what oriented me towards these issues. And then when Mike Morrow, I believe it was, early July of 21 said, we quote unquote, shed the risk. I replied in his tweet there, I said, how exactly did you sell the loan and recognize an impairment on your balance sheet? Did you write a CDS transaction, which ultimately means you're paying for the fair value of the losses? How exactly did it happen? And there was no clear answer to that innocuous question coming just from a place of curiosity, just trying to understand what happened. And that's when I said something doesn't mm. make sense here and I stayed on the hunt. Hmm. So one thing that's become really obvious now looking back in, in, in hindsight is uh, the interconnectedness of capital markets and crypto. And at the heart of all of this connectedness, oftentimes was this widowmaker trade was 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 GBTC, right? So GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, was one of the first regulated entities that allowed ordinary investors to get Bitcoin price exposure. And over time, over years, trust turns into this behemoth. And there's, there becomes all these kind of players and, and funds uh, and, and, and actually companies as well, making these big, massive, like leveraged bets on GBTC. 
And that turned into what is kind of known today as the Widowmaker trade. So I think it would be helpful if you could almost set up what is the Widowmaker trade and how did that lead to a lot of the things that we're seeing today? Great question. So here's the background. As you pointed out, GBTC uh, had a premium to the NAV of the underlying Bitcoin. And it was a trade that motivated players like BlockFi and hedge funds like Three Hours Capital to the to do the following sequence. They would buy Bitcoin spot and then they would notify Grayscale their intention to deliver that. And that trade would enable them to lock in the spread between the traded price of GBTC versus the NAV. And that premium was 20% to 50%. And that trade just for BlockFi made well over $100 million. And that's just one entity. So three hours capital and others are the same thing. It's a, it's a form of a carry trade because you can't hedge out your risk. You are taking risk that the spread is stable and at least remains positive. So now as Coinbase was approaching its IPO, that spread started to narrow to zero and then flipped to negative. And that kind of makes sense because Coinbase is an alternative way to mainstream access to digital assets. So that spread flipped to negative. It fell down to 10%, the 20% discount in AV. So now hedge funds like Three Hours Capital said, hey, we believe this discount is going to close. And they and other hedge funds started buying that, that discount. Now, where it went wrong is Three Hours Capital was borrowing from Genesis to execute that trade. So they had a levered carry trade position that was put on. And of course, the demise of Luna, uh, and then uh, with spreads blowing out further, caused Three Hours Capital to default. And that set in chain a series of dominoes that led us to where we are today. DCG. Oh, go ahead, Santi. I was just uh, curious, Ram. I mean, there's a lot of people that, again, in hindsight, say, hey, why were you even lending unsecured um, or you know, under collateralized or no collateral? Why did Three Arrows get such special treatment? I mean, I, I at the time, was a Parify. You know, I, even now, as, you know, I, most of these loans for the vast majority of players are heavily collateralized. At what point did you, in your capacity back then or even today, like how did standards become so loose? Because this happens in every market, not just in crypto, but why did three hours specifically get, sounds like they got some pretty special. I have have no idea. I mean, the the standards were awful. It's not as if it tightened and loosened over time. They started a baseline level of awful. So when we were at Cross River, uh, we interviewed all of these firms as well, because again, I'm a bank. I'm like, how do I give warehouse lending to others? How do I lend to the lender in a senior secured position? And I'll give you an example. I spoke to Celsius, it was a 30 minute call. After that call, I told my team, we will never ever issue a loan to Celsius. We didn't even done any diligence. It was the initial 30 minute call where they're putting their best foot forward. But you could see that they were acting like hedge funds. And that's what's fundamentally at flaw here. Um, so I'm not sure. Look, you have massive concentrated positions. You saw that with Genesis too. They had a massive concentrated loan, not just against three years capital, but also against uh, Alameda. I think part of it, Santi, is trust. They said, oh, these guys are blue chip players. They know what they're doing. And then you also had these round trip equity investments, right? So remember BlockFi had an equity investment from FTX and BlockFi was also financing yeah. FTX. So I think that was a part of it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's let's move on now into kind of how this all kind of unfolded. And I think you were, at the time, kind of sounded the alarm fairly early on. And as this was going down, the market was already very skittish because you, FTX is, you had already transpired. And so... The, the the skepticism when Moro, which was the the CEO, I think of Genesis, started saying, "Hey, no, our balance sheet. Anytime now, the market, <laughs> our balance sheet is strong. It's sort of like 
It's definitely not. Your runaway. balance sheet is not smart, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> yeah. This is sort of like the, but the market was learning back then. But I think you were very much in that conversation and asking Genesis to provide more straightforward answers. Yeah. Now we have the complaint. And in hindsight, a lot of the things that you were talking about back then, you know, turned out to be true. It made a lot of sense. So walk us through kind of all that flow and how that. Sure. Really sure. No. In, in July, there was no smoking gun. I, I was just asking those questions out of curiosity. Even in November, after Barry Silver published his letter to investors, in general, my approach was deferential and I was taking them at face value, although things still didn't make any sense, right? Namely, where was the impairment? If you have a loss, that takes hit to a balance sheet. And that question was never answered. So I, I, I stayed on that question. Then over time, my attitude and perception of DCG changed. So in November, mm. my view was, yeah, these guys will raise the money, they'll fill the hole, and they'll move on. They've got great assets and great skills at cash machine. And when we did not see those answers, and then they started to play word games with terms like current account mm -hmm. uh, and hiding behind technical word salads, then my skepticism started to deepen as it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, and now, of course, here we are, the NYAG has filed a complaint against DCG and Barry Silver personally, you know, as well as Gemini. And they validated, actually, those hypotheses, which we never really knew for sure. And it, it, was, it was great. That it was definitely satisfying to see that. But I'll tell you this, when you make a public observation uh, that could jeopardize someone's business, you are taking the risk of, of being mm -hmm. accused of defamation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, took, I don't take satisfaction in calling those issues out, but it, it, it was satisfying to see the NYAG say, yeah, here, here's what happened. It looked like a recap of all these Twitter threads have been writing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And just to conceptualize this, which we talked about on a prior episode, the gap was roughly $1.1 billion. Correct. Um, that Genesis was in the hole because yeah. largely because of three arrows, this widow trade. Correct. And the it, it, Barry at the time, as a CEO of this holding company, DCG, had a few options. One was personally guarantee it, plug the hole. He's probably worth a couple billion back then. I don't know how much now, but you know, he's done incredibly successful for himself. Right. He has multiple other business lines. You could take a view on the stream of Grayscale, which is a golden goose and like use some of that to, you know, go to a, someone like Apollo, some hedge fund, some venture fund and say, Hey guys, we're in a tight spot. We need some rescue financing. Help us through, get, survive this patch. Right. He didn't do any of that. He basically just pretended to plug the hole through a promissory note that had 1% interest and repayable and sort of like, uh, what is it like 10 years or something like that? Um, which was intended really to dress it up and, um, not and provide a false sense that the balance sheet was sound, but it wasn't the case as we now right. learned specifically through a complaint before we even dive into all of the mechanics. Let me ask you if you're in Barry's situation, what would you have done then and there? Yeah, it's, it's a mm. phenomenal question. I've actually been trying to sort that out. And my first reaction was to say, certainly after the demise of Three Hours Capital, when Genesis clearly had a negative equity position, that's come out now, would have been to let Genesis default and go into bankruptcy. Genesis was a subsidiary that was wholly owned, yeah. but they could have cordoned off the liabilities. And that's that. But here's what we learned in the NYAG complaint. What we learned is that DCG and Barry himself was personally directing Genesis to refinance its loans. And therefore, the reason I allege that DCG did not let Genesis just go into bankruptcy and protect the mothership mm -hmm. is because then Genesis would have called in the loans and not refinanced DCG and DCG didn't have the cash. Mm. Right. So that, that was a puzzle that finally was answered last week. Now, now let's back up from there. Like, well, how do you avoid having been in that position? Like, what's the method? What's the root cause learning? The root cause learning would would be to not 
do the Widowmaker trade, not to borrow from Genesis to go levered long on your own product, believing your own BS that the discount's going to close. Now, could Barry have foreseen the demise of Three Hours Capital, which was considered a blue chip hedge fund, much less the demise of Alameda and FTX, which were considered blue chip by world class VCs? Hindsight's 2020, right? Nevertheless, it's just bad judgment. You know, here's another interesting story. I, I heard this from an informed party that worked for Barry, and he said that. Barry's vision was to build the next Berkshire Hathaway. They had the cash cow and great scale and they're funding new investments and build a modern Berkshire Hathaway. And Berkshire Hathaway is actually a carry trade. They sure. borrow, that's what they do, right? They borrow, they have debt that's outstanding, well over $100 billion in debt, uh, and they buy assets with that. They get the depreciation off the debt and it's a carry trade. The difference is this, Berkshire Hathaway's loans are one, they're non-callable. Okay. Two, they're investing in assets that generate cash flow that help to pay down the debt and they're great assets that they own. Whereas what Barry was doing was a margin trade. Buffett never does a margin trade. So he had a good concept and built an extraordinary business, especially around grayscale. But he, uh, whether ego or believing other people around him, and he himself arguably was deceived by three years capital and FTX. Of course he was. Yep. The bad decision. So, so the, for, for listeners, the, the real key here is Barry uh, personally, I forget if it's personally or DC at the DCG level, um, did this care did this carry trade, meaning like playing the spread at on, the DCG uh, level for sure. At the, DC, at the DCG level. And because of that, had he not done that, then you could have just put Genesis in receivership, but go through bankruptcy. Or plug the hole yourself. That, that's it. Yeah, Genesis would just go through bankruptcy, and I they could create a new Genesis a year later if they wanted to. Been fun. Wait, but yeah. I, but didn't DC DCG didn't have the cash, so they needed Genesis. They needed Genesis here. That's why they didn't let Genesis go into bankruptcy. Right, because, because, because they needed the cash. They because right. Well, they what happened? Refinance they, themselves basically. Because, right, because Genesis would have pressured DCG into bankruptcy. They would have called in their loans. So they Sorry, borrow, again, it, oh, if Genesis had gone into bankruptcy, DCG then loses control of DCG, you're yeah, saying? Exactly, because a trustee would take over Genesis. Like if a trustee now, and the trustee has a fiduciary obligation to man maximize recoveries for the creditors. Mm. Right. So when Genesis is not in bankruptcy, then Barry can control Genesis. That's why in July, he did not let Genesis go into bankruptcy. That's why I alleged my hypothesis. I might be wrong. I believe that's the right answer, though, right? He mm -hmm. said, if he can control Genesis, then he can issue orders. And he did. That's what the NIG complaint shows, that Barry Silver personally directed Genesis to refinance the loans, and he set loan terms. That's self-dealing. Yeah. Can, so, tell, us, tell us more about that. Like, So there's this $1.1 billion promissory note. Why is that so, why is that so problematic here? Here's, here's why. So the messaging from Genesis and its executives and from Barry in the summer of last year was that DCG was going to save the day. DCG put its balance sheet on the line and quote unquote, assumed certain liabilities, end quote, okay? Meaning they ate the three years capital losses. That was a message designed to reassure the public and reassures Genesis's customers, okay? But now what the NAG, NYAG complaint shows is that Barry and other executives are making comments such as, we cannot let the public, our customers, understand that we have a solvency issue. Mm. Okay. So <clears throat> the promissory note was a deception. When you want to bail out a subsidiary, what do you do? You inject capital. If there is an impairment, I mean, an impairment is when you have a, a write down of assets on your balance sheet. And now Genesis has negative equity, it's last summer. The only way to fill that negative equity hole is to have an equity infusion. That's the only way to do that. And the promissory note did not do that. In fact, the promissory note uh, borrowed from Genesis at mm -hmm. favorable terms. Now they, they didn't uh, borrow digital offsets, at least in that financing, but it was really a shell game. It was a way to swap out this bad asset that Genesis had on its balance sheet to three years capital 
with this good asset called a loan to DCG. So it did strengthen technically the balance sheet of Genesis, but the promissory note's primary purpose was to deceive the public and its customers. It replaced the lies it says here in the in the in the NYAG thing. It, it replaced the liability with this illiquid ten year promissory note. Correct. And that promissory note. Well, what's the present value of that promissory note? It's not even equal to the size of the hole on the balance yeah. sheet. Right? If, you, if you take a one point one billion dollar loan, that's not liquid, payable in ten years. That's worth one one percent interest rate. And you present value discount that at DCG's credit risk. I got something like two hundred fifty million dollars in chain, but the hole is one point one billion dollars. Right. So it's a fiction that was designed to deceive. Yeah. Do you have a sense for the magnitude in the cash position uh, that DCG was back then because they were doing this widow trade? So that's all private information. Uh, clearly, they didn't have the funds. And yeah. that has been made clear through the NYAG report. But we know that they shoveled over $760 million in the GBTC Widowmaker carry trade. Talk, think about that. So they had a lot of cash, but running up to the three hours capital demise, every quarter they were doing that trade with their free cash flow. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. nuts. They took this great business, DCG, and they bet on their own product, the GPTC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the discount has um, compressed fairly dramatically. Like it, it, I think at the time where this was going down, the, the discount was like 20, 30%, I want to say. Correct. Yes. It went all the way down to 47, 48% uh, beginning of this year when, you know, crypto markets hit a bottom. It is now tightened to like, I want to say negative 15 the discount is like 15 something percent, which is kind of like normal, sort of like largely on this news that at some point it will be converted to an ETF. Right. Um, was was Barry in Barry's mind, like, because we'll get to this later, but we'll involve like um, Gemini here and the Winkle Vi putting pressure on Barry. And was Barry just trying to buy time, thinking that at some point this will be converted, the premium will compress and then you know, you, you kind of like dig yourself out of a great of a hole. Yeah. Great question. So, so absolutely. He was buying time because the more time he has, then the more grayscale can generate hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and cash flow for the mothership. So absolutely. He was buying time. And that's why we saw endless extensions in the negotiations with Gemini and Genesis. So, that is their strategy by time. Now, was it that they were waiting for the ETF conversion? I don't believe that's the case. And the reason why is DCG did not own enough GBTC such that if the ETF was approved, that pull to par or that discount goes away would not have been enough to enable DCG to make a whole genesis. I believe they just wanted to buy time so Grayscale could generate enough cash so they could pay off their liabilities. Got it. Um, uh, one of your recent tweet threads got a lot of attention because as the complaint was coming out and you reviewed it in short order, you said, hey, this is actually worse than Enron. And a lot of people were caught off guard. You know, say, wait a minute, like you know, we're, we're... So walk us through your thinking as yeah. to why, why that is. So, right. So Enron was an elaborate accounting fraud that uh, the then CFO, Andrew Fausto and their CEO, you know, perpetually in public markets, they had subsidiaries that they controlled. They had executives on those subsidiaries like the CFO. They had self-dealing. But here's the thing about Enron. Each one-off transaction is legal on the surface. It was the aggregation of all of that together plus the intention to deceive that made that fraud, okay? And they were able to get their auditors, Arthur Anderson, since no longer does not exist, and the rest of bankers go along with it. They said, hey, look, it's, it's legal on a one-off basis, every step of these hundreds of transactions. But what DCG did was beyond that, right? DCG, uh, for example, um, allegedly issued 
fraudulent balance sheet statements uh, via Genesis to their customers. I don't want them to do that. Uh, Genesis was playing technical word games with the term current assets, which can be used to define assets that are performing. In other words, assets that are current or assets that are current, meaning can be liquidated within one year. It's a technical kind of word salad that they were playing. Uh, and also the promissory note, and the lack of disclosure around that. So Genesis and DCG um, crossed the line in that deception in a way that Enron did not. Now, Enron cost the public a lot more money than DCG, but in terms of the brazenness of it, it was more uh, serious than what you saw with Enron. Yeah. And particularly, I, I remember reading, they, they sort of omitted certain footnotes around this hole that they were plugging. I mean, that, yeah. that in and of itself is just, you know, fabricating Correct. statements. Yeah, NYAG is requesting that DCG be prohibited from being the security and commodities business. Well, Grayscale is that type of entity. So Grayscale will need to be sold. I expect uh, that DCG will challenge the NYAG complaint. So this has time to play out, uh, but ultimately I think the NYAG will prevail and Grayscale will be auctioned off. Uh, and so that is one consequence from this. Second is DCG will be mired in endless settlements and lawsuits. Mm. I mean, they just keep piling on and on. And of course the SEC already filed a complaint against DCG. So, I think DCG is effectively an insolvent zombie company. They will never be able to raise venture capital. What kind of career risk is any VC going to take putting fire into that mess, <laughs> right? And if they can't raise venture capital, then how are they going to make everyone whole? Um, it'll be interesting because Grayscale is the cash cow. So in a way, DCG is going to be in a form of indentured servitude to its creditors for a long time, just leeching the cash flow off of Grayscale to make their creditors whole. And I think when that's done, then the assets of DCG are auctioned off and DCG is functionally dead. And I also think Barry uh, may very well go to prison, right? Mm -hmm. Enron executives went to prison. If you believe that this is fraud and you believe it's more egregious than Enron in the brazenness of behavior, then my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, is that Barry um, could go to prison. Mm -hmm. Let's double click on that um, for, for listeners that might not be aware. So um, when you say DCG has a fair amount of uh, obligations because they were doing this widow trade, they were borrowing at, uh, Genesis as a center really interacted with pretty much everyone in crypto. I mean, they, they were the dominant mm -hmm. market maker. They, you know, they would borrow assets from a bunch of people, funds, whales, whatever to, and then give you some yield. Um, they would take assets from folks like uh, Gemini. And then what you're saying is those creditors that are, that are owed, because if, if you were interacting, a lot of people had money with Genesis and they are now stuck until there's some resolution. Um, those creditors at some point may recover part of their assets made hold in some capacity yeah. uh, through the three arrows estate kind of liquidation through kind of all the debtors that are involved on the other side, including DCG itself, because it was borrowing from yes. um, Genesis, right? And, and, and that's what might trigger a sale of Grayscale, a sale of all the hundreds of venture investments, um, that yeah. DCG, I mean, DCG is one of the largest venture funds. Uh, yeah, crypto. that's so right. All of those positions would be auctioned off by the trustee, right? Yeah. Ultimately, and that's what will happen, I expect. Ultimately, yes. to recoup and, and maximize recovery for the creditors here. I believe that'll, that'll happen ultimately, yes. Again, and, you know, DCG will dispute the NY AG's complaint, and we have not heard the answer from Barrier DCG. So, you know, maybe they can find some plausible explanation. I doubt it. I doubt it. And this looks pretty damning, the evidence that they've heard in the NY AG complaint. But yeah, DCG owes some, something north of $600, 700000000 million to its subsidiary Genesis, depends on the price of Bitcoin. 
And even beyond that, DCG and Barry are being sued for being defrauded. They're being sued by Gemini. And others will act on the NYAG complaint and cite the evidence in that complaint to make additional lawsuits. So it's, it's not enough to make the creditors whole. And they will be sued to oblivion. What, what is the uh, possible effect of the G, of this on the GBTC ETF conversion, do you think? Do you think it's dead, dead on arrival? Yeah. Yeah, it's that it's even a certain. I think the GBTC will convert. I think ETF will convert. This is a. Uh, you, so you think Grayscale will get it, even though yeah, the. Yeah, I don't think there's any impact, actually. Okay. Gray, well, they're, they're fully uh, segregated. Like this does not, from a creditor liability exposure perspective, you're not affected. From a reputation, uh, yeah. on the margin, I'd say they don't. They don't get approved. I, I don't think that they will be a, approved first. Well, I'm, just, I'm just here. I like the and the reputation is yeah. important, right? Like I'm hearing Rom say that you know DCG can never get a uh, invest. You know Barry might go to jail. DCG will never have an investor again. On the other side, Barry Barry owns Grayscale too. So now you're saying that. so. So Grayscale uh, is in good standing with the law. Yeah, that's it. And due process applies. Yeah. So there's no. There's also a. Um, it will be a dispute between Barry, DCG, and the New York AG, right? So Barry will have an answer. He'll say, I deny these. It is not the role of a regulator to prejudge. That dispute will have to go through a legal process. I think, I believe we know how that's going to conclude. And even if it does conclude in that way, um, which will take at least a year to play out, Right, and then maybe that's appealed. These ETF decisions have to happen before then, and then the SEC will make their determinations based on the queue in which those applications were filed. So I don't believe there's any actually impact to to Grayscale or to GBTC or or e ETH. That's interesting. When you talk about the the creditors, Gemini is the biggest creditor. Or who are who are the other big creditors? Yeah, uh, uh, the biggest creditors are Genesis and Gemini. So, yeah, DCGO is 607 million plus to um, Genesis uh, and, um, you know, depending on how you count the math, uh, I'm going to say about a billion to Gemini, but there's also collateral that they've pledged in the form of GBTC. So that reduces the amount that they, are, that they owe to Gemini. Hmm. And there's 220,000 borrowers that have been impacted and people that have lost their life savings. Gotcha. Retired couples and, yeah. So I know, yeah. I know you're not a lawyer, but what like the the NYAG complaint was I think civil in nature. Yes. Um, why if you're if this is worse than Enron, why was this? Why is it such a? Why, why is it just a civil uh, complaint? So a criminal action would come from likely the Southern District of New York. Mm, okay. So uh, that could very well be coming, especially if NYAG prevails. Right. In other words, those findings of fact are um, ag agreed upon, right? Hmm. And you know the NYG complaint uh, does say in one area that uh, that multiple repeated criminal acts were conducted. Yeah. Um, playing devil's advocate and thinking kind of in what version is this not like fraud in what version because barry's statement and dcg statement right after the complaint was hey we're actually disappointed in this complaint we've tried to work with our counterparties we've yeah. engaged with the right the you know uh, southern mm -hmm. district of new york i guess and they were they were disappointed that of, of this kind of complaint and they said we've mm -hmm. been doing the right thing we continue to do the right thing we try to like work through the situation like I know, I, I, I know where you stand, but yeah, what are what would be a situation where that might be true? Interesting question. So let's let's play it out, right? So Barry would say, "Hey, no, we were defrauded by Three Hours Capital. We were defrauded by Alameda. We communicated with our clients. Uh, we should have done a better job adding footnotes. We should have done a better job defining where current assets are." Um, Barry probably says, I did not know the CFO refused to join client calls. I did not know that the CFO and others were, uh, you know, having bullet points that were designed to optimize 
for DCG uh, and Genesis retaining capital and deposit. So it's something, it's something like that. It's like the FBF defense, right? It's a, hey, we were negligent. We could have done a better job. We could have dotted I's, cross T's, um, but it was fast moving and we ourselves were negatively impacted. Uh, it's something like that. This episode is brought to you by Chronicle Protocol, the best on-chain source for cost-efficient, verifiable data. For anyone who listens to Empire a lot, you know that we talk a lot about MakerDAO. Well, Chronicle Protocol is this novel Oracle solution that has exclusively secured over 10 billion in assets for Maker and its ecosystem since 2017. And for the first time ever, super excited to share here that Chronicle's Oracle service is now publicly available for anyone to use. Compared to using other Oracle services, Chronicle offers a 60% reduction in gas fees. They have an unparalleled level of transparency at Chronicle. They offer a dashboard that allows anyone to track the genesis and trajectory of the data it provides, marking this milestone in on-chain data availability. Chronicle is endorsed by a network of the most revered validators, including Etherscan, Infura, Gitcoin, DYDX, and MakerDAO. It is time for a paradigm shift in Oracle development, a future where data is verifiable, operational costs are contained, and the possibilities are immense. You can learn more about Chronicle at chroniclelabs.org. That is chroniclelabs.org. I want to get to Gemini here because that was fairly interesting. Throughout all of this, the Winklevi brothers, I think Gemini, through this EARN program, um, has stuck somewhere close to 400 million, somewhere 350 million, right? That they had, they're owed by uh, Genesis, I believe. I think it's more than that. It's more than that. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, so it's more than that. Yeah. And throughout this process, the Winklevi brothers have been very vocal, right. you know, uh, against Barry and DCG. And, and of course, now the, the complaint also involves them in the sense that they should have stopped the program much earlier, given what has come to light, that in board discussions, they actually knew of the degrading situation of Genesis, their counterparty. They, some executives withdrew from the EARN program ahead of time. Um, and so the complaint here says that they, I'm not sure, I don't think it's as severe, but it does make the point where hey, you guys should have done a way better job of protecting users. And internally, you knew something was up and you didn't act fast enough. Right. So I put it. Yeah, you know, the Gemini story is definitely complicated for sure. So you're, first off, you're right. The, um, the NYAG complaint does call Gemini a fraud, number one, just serious. But they accuse... Gemini of lack of disclosure and not being faithful to the representations they made to their clients on the website. And then they cite as evidence, which you pointed out, Santi, that you had executives that uh, had uh, redeemed from Gemini Earn while they were informed of the, the risk rating, which was triple C. Um, and also Gemini continued to funnel deposits to Genesis while they were aware of these risks. So uh, the Gemini is a complicated story because they were also defrauded. Yeah. There were no question. There's no question they're defrauded. Not, and not only that, here's what happened. So they, Gemini issues a letter to redeem from uh, Genesis after they've done what they're supposed to do. Right. And then Barry says, if you were, if you were forced us to redeem, we will file for bankruptcy. So you're screwed anyway. Now think about that for a moment, right? The kind of position that Gemini is in. I mean, they are between a rock and a hard place. I mean, I, this is what happens when you deal with a fraudster. You're screwed on day one, right? So let's say Gemini six months earlier had put in a redemption notice. And I think they should have, right? That would have been the right move. Genesis would have said the same thing. They would have said, oh, we're going to file for bankruptcy because those loans are not liquid. And 
Many of them were open term loans, but their borrowers were folks like Alameda would not have been able to deliver. Yeah. So they were, they were in a, they're in a difficult position. I, I agree. It's a lesser set of infractions than DCG and Barry, but they're open questions. Like why, why did they let the money keep flowing in? I don't understand that. Um, maybe it's because they thought that if they said, Hey, we're stopping the program, then people in the program would redeem in mass, which would also kill <laughs> Genesis. I don't know. I want to, I want to answer those questions though. I did, but I think something that the public doesn't appreciate is that it's not enough for someone on the board to say, Oh, that business is bad as Lehman. Right. It's like, well, yeah. what do you do with the current situation? We got an illiquid loan book. By the way, that board member is not, an executive board members are allowed to have opinions mm -hmm. it is it's definitely a bad look for sure yeah but um, also people are allowed to redeem from programs if they would like but clearly the pretty people that did that had asymmetric information that the public yeah. did not have and the public should have yeah you could you could have argued that they were triple c they had an internal rating system you could have argued that that system and that rating scoring system was off from day one. Everything is triple C in crypto, guys. Like there's smart contract risk. There is yeah, <laughs> volatility risk. There's just illiquidity risk. Like everything compounded and stacked on each other. You could argue right. it's like cool. junk status. What, what I also want to know is that triple C rating, it looks like they arrived at that after the program had launched. Yes. Because they that, initially had it at tr triple B and then the downgraded to triple C because the crypto right. prices were they were largely looking at crypto prices and said, okay, gosh, this might really is lead to a situation of impairment. Right, right. I think the case against Gemini is going to be weaker than the case against DCG. They'll be held accountable. They will have a restitution order that's going to come from the SEC or NYAG or settlement anyway. So I think that'll help Gemini earn. But the punches they landed on DCG were much more damning. Right? Mm -hmm. These uh, complaints have a lot of storytelling going on in there, too, right? I mean, they're trying to make a public case. For example, they'll say, uh, and no less than one year later, it was found to have a triple C rate. Well, no kidding. Crypto fell apart. <laughs> so that's not, a, that's not an indictment. That's just the nature of the business. And of course... It was a bad decision to have these programs to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other part, I think, where the, that case is weaker and they allege securities fraud, they say it was an unregistered securities offering. And that part of the law and regulation is very vague. Look, there are people that uh, raise money for like a Hollywood film. They earn a finder's fee. So they're mm -hmm. raising money to invest in a project where their success is based on the efforts of others. All the criteria, the high, how we test are met the SEC doesn't take enforcement actions against people that raise money in finder's fees, right? It's a legitimate gray area. And I saw this with companies like Lending Club and Prosper in the 2008, 2009 cycle. They were uh, crowdfunding uh, dollars to invest in loans to consumers. And then the SEC said, oh, that's not a loan, that's a security. So when is a loan a loan? And when is a loan in a, a security? Yeah. Um, in... So we talked about kind of the different outcomes here. Um, what are you mostly paying attention to in terms of second order effects? Um, you know, you we, we've talked a little bit about they have a huge venture portfolio. They have multiple other units. Um, in crypto, we always talk about the contagion of, of stuff. Um, yeah. How do you, play yeah, play, play that out for us. I don't think there's actually much contagion. Yeah, I really don't think there's much contagion left. I mean, there's some smaller <clears throat> offshore exchanges that may have quite a risk issues, but they're not in a chain of contagion. Um, that's one. Notwithstanding what text went on with Binance, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. <laughs> so let's figure out. Let's get that cleared out there. Yeah, yeah once you figure that out, let us know. <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, that venture portfolio is going to cause markdowns in the secondary mm -hmm. markets, right? So would you rather invest in a new crypto startup or own a chunk of Foundry or Luno at a, at a big discount to their initial investment price? I'd rather do the latter. So, you know, I think that could have a negative effect on venture markets. Of course, you're seeing that across all of venture. You're seeing that in the fintech venture. You're seeing that in every market. These dislocated secondary sales and markdowns are happening. 
So that's one. Number two is Michael Sonnenschein gets a promotion. He's actually a winner of all this, right? So he's the CEO of Grayscale. They'll get spun off. Yes, they'll have to cut the fees to make it more economical as more ETFs come online, but he doesn't have to report to Barry Silver anymore. Not that there was any negative relationship there, but yeah, he's set. He's set for life. Michael Sonnenschein is doing all right. <laughs> we were, we were uh, fellow we Emory guy with me. <laughs> well, funny, he was at Fig. We were both JP Morgan Investment Banking. He was a year, uh, uh, oh, I right? think he was a year ahead of me. And he was in the financial institutions group in the investment bank. And so we kind of, yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Third, third is, you know, you are seeing um, startups saying, hey, we're going to do this the right way, right? So you're seeing the rise of startups trying to do decentralized prime brokerage, which is what the business of Genesis was. Uh, and you're also seeing startups trying to do just classic prime brokerage. Uh, Goldman is entering the business. Goldman is now financing Bitcoin and Ethereum using their balance sheet. That's how it should be, by the way. Goldman has like a credit rating for prime brokerage. I'm very critical of Goldman in other areas, but that's, that's what you want to be seen as a counterparty that's issuing loans. Yeah, definitely. So the winners here are maybe potentially the folks that might be able to pick apart the venture portfolio by cents in the dollar, folks that might maybe a Fidelity, BlackRock that might buy Grayscale and just put uh, up very BlackRock won't buy that. BlackRock's, I don't know who's going to buy it. It's not going to be a name brand that buys this thing well, because of reputational risk and they can build it themselves. Well, you just they buy the depositor base, right? I mean, uh, and the, the, you know, whoever buys them is going to inherit all the lawsuits too. So they're not going to, they're not going to, even though those lawsuits at the DCG level, it's just the reputation alone, the brain damage. I thought you could carve that out. Like, like when, when uh, Credit Suisse bought UB, well, other way around. Right. Uh, so it, it, how would that work though? So they'd say they auction off. It's look, it's possible. Like a jet, Grayscale so far is clean, right? Yeah, they, they're, they're clean. I don't think they have any, and you can make a provision in there where the, the price reflects, you know. Maybe. I, I think there's a lot of brain damage, reputation sure. risk. I don't think, I think BlackRock's like, look, we have our docs. We know how to go do this. They already filed their docs. They, you know, they've got the right vendor ecosystem in place. Um, who are the other? How would you, by the way, how would you value Grayscale? Well, Grayscale, I would look at their cash flow stream and then assign a multiple to that. So a couple Pro forma million. for conversion because the management fee is not going to be what it is today, right? Correct, correct. So I, I'd, I'd assume that steady state BIPs are closer to 30 to 40. They'll probably try to land at 50, but they're ETFs in Canada that have 30 BIPs to 40 BIPs. Um, and if you're not competitive, then you lose assets. It goes to the, you know, goes to someone else. So, you know, they probably have an efficient operation. So 30 BIPs times whatever uh, the remaining Bitcoin that'll be held is. Right now, it's north of 10 billion uh, in terms of Bitcoin value with a dozen to two dozen ETFs coming online inevitably. And there's, there's over 20 applications, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're going to have a market share game unfold. Uh, and there's a lot of animosity towards Grayscale. Like that brand is very sour. So I think they're going to lose a lot of AUM. So I don't know. Let's say it's 2 billion times 30 bips. Can we do the quick math on that? Yeah, that's fine. On their ongoing um, income, but here are the other losers: folks that invested in DCG. Six million of management fees. Uh, seems too low. Maybe 60, no? 60. 60 million. Sixty sounds about right. Sixty sounds about right. So Michael Sonnenfeld will do well. He's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ron, when you said that, um, their their portfolio. So they have DCG has owns a couple of companies like Luna and Foundry and stuff, and then they've made about one hundred and twenty investments out of their venture arm. Correct. Uh, I would. Push. I don't think their venture arm is going to get impacted. Like they're, um, I don't think the 120 portfolio companies are going to get impacted. It's just one less company on your on your on your cap table. Well, I mean, they were they were largely minority investors in many of these companies. So let's continue. Companies will continue to operate, do what they're supposed to do. Right. Uh, it's just but that you're saying it's more like the Lunos found. Like Foundry is actually the largest uh, uh, Bitcoin mining pool, I think, right now, and I'm I'm pretty sure in the world now. For, so, it's always been number one, number two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that their stock will be sold and auctioned off by DCG. That doesn't impact those companies uh, directly. Well, there'll be a mark on that. That's probably a discount to their true value because that whole portfolio will be sold. So it's going to impact venture markets. Also, 
equity investors in DCG. So DCG did a round in November 2021, which is top of the market at a $10 billion valuation. Those equity investors are going to get a zero. Mm -hmm. I was looking at buying secondary way before that at like a $2 billion, then $3 billion, and it was always Roford. The company was always buying back and it was super, super protective. But the thesis was just that. It is like, can be a Berkshire Hathaway. It has multiple business lines, great venture portfolio. And even if you did some of the parts and we did a whole sensitivity analysis on like, even if you ascribe zero value to a, some of the units, like it was still like Grayscale alone was very, it's, it is a great business. Oh, absolutely. It's a phenomenal business. And you know, what's interesting is that Barry never sold shares. In fact, they they were buying back shares from investors yeah. using the cash yeah, flow. Always. Right. Now, in retrospect, that's another decision he would have done differently. This is the kind of the interesting thing, like the psychology of Barry to get in crypto early, accumulate a Bitcoin, bet on his convictions and build these businesses. And that foresight allowed him to create this you know, empire. Here we are on the Empire Podcast. They built this empire. Yeah. But that same conviction also spelled his demise. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of a Scarface. You shouldn't get high in your own supply. Yeah. Right, right. That's it. Like, like, <laughs> that if was the killer. Take that levered bet, yeah. On, if, on, uh, it's an interesting it's kind of tragic flaw, though, right? Like that psychology that made him this extraordinary entrepreneur and created enormous wealth through that single-minded focus, even when Bitcoin was non-consensus, you know, 10 plus years ago, still non-consensus now. That prompts him to believe that, oh, this will work out and we'll figure this out. And that I think if you had a really good person on the board, I don't know who was on the board of DCG, but anyone in finance that is worth their salt would have told you carry trades are incredibly risky, particularly if they had looked at the structure, would have said no. To your point around Berkshire is Berkshire because it does it in a very particular way. Right. The way this was being done was in one version, risking it all for an yeah. incremental, you know, decent bump in, in profitability, but with a huge kind of asymmetry on the downside, they could have lost it all. And in crypto, you sort of have to assume that, A, there's always going to be volatility and there could be moments of raw, like very tough liquidity in the market. And so mm-hmm. the structure of all of that, like may, maybe that's, I don't know the particulars of who was on the board. It was, it, was Barry, it was Barry. It was Barry, Glenn Hutchins, and then um, Larry Summers on the board. He left. Glenn, Glenn Hutchins. That's from Silvergate, right? Uh, from yes, exactly. So Glenn Hutchins, and then um, uh, Larry Lenahan, I think was his name. It's the guy who started. Uh, he started First Mark Capital and one of the other funds. He, he had Larry Summers as well from you know. And then Larry removed himself. It's Larry, correct. Correct. Larry's very. Larry's the head of the game. Larry's like, I'm out. He's that out. Yeah. Headline, I'm not, yeah. But you know, I, I would love to kind of understand that dynamic and how involved they were in understanding this particular operation. So, so, so Larry's interesting because Larry was on the board of Lending Club. Uh-huh. Okay. And Lending Club, I worked with my prior life. I was an angel investor in Lending Club. I know that business very well. And Larry also removed himself from the Lending Club board when their then management was accused of fraud. Not, not, nothing actually transpired, da da da. But he took off at that point, right? So, but I think you, you know, it's an excellent point around, you know, Barry was in his own thought bubble. And who was there really to challenge? I mean, did Barry never had a co founder, it seems like. No. Right. So maybe that's one of the lessons, right? You need someone to check, to check you or call out your own BS, right? Or like, hey, look, it's a good idea, but maybe this doesn't make any sense for these reasons. <laughs> Yeah, I, I doubt the board was really hands-on or active. Like, if you get a board, if you have a celebrity board, folks like Larry Summers, then that board is probably more about biz dev and marketing rather than actually talking to them to get great advice mm-hmm. on how to build your business. So I doubt that that board was highly engaged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a lesson there probably in corporate governance and, and, and making sure that you have, I mean, FTX didn't most of the vcs didn't have a board seat never asked for a board seat and i think uh 
Yeah, I, th I think in crypto, you see these personalities like, look, we're all in some capacity a bit crazy to believe in this stuff, especially right, right. like, but I think it's always worth having someone that will, uh, the temptation is you're, you're thinking that, look, a lot of this is cutting edge. A lot of it is innovating, but there's some things that shouldn't be reinvented. Vesting schedules, yeah. uh, so many things like that we don't need to reinvent the wheel and all these other things. I totally um, and I think he did a very miscalculated bet on doing carry trades. And I think a lot of hedge funds, a lot of sophisticated risk managers will tell you, don't do it. Like it just right. absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely. I mean, the hedge funds and, and banks have far more risk management. They don't have concentrated counterparty risk, which they had both in three years capital and Genesis. They made a lot of mistakes. And I think the other thing that that Genesis and DCG and Barry missed was they did not use DeFi to manage their risk. But why were they taking on counterparty risk? You know, three years capital allegedly double or triple pledged their collateral to multiple parties, which is which is fraud. And we saw that by the way back in 2008 again with these subprime mortgage lenders. So that's another thing. You know, if he he was highly convicted around crypto, but did not insist upon the technology or even basic lending standards of the market. Yeah. Yeah. Raw, man, this is great. Um, appreciate you any, coming any, on. Yeah. Anything else, I guess, uh, Ram? I mean, you're, I would encourage everyone to go follow Ram. You're constantly tweeting about not just crypto, but I think you have a very fresh traditional finance lens and apply it to crypto. You're also talking about a lot of stuff in the market. And so some, some great threads. Um, anything else like, you know, parting thoughts and just maybe things that you're looking out for in the current environment? Sure. So for, first off, very kind of you, big fan of your podcast and Santa, you and I are both, uh, trapped by crypto crossover. <laughs> and, uh, so it's good to have both worlds. Like the promise of digital assets. We're, we're cool again now for a while. I was like, <laughs> guys, go back oh, to your... We're cool. Yeah. If we're cool, <laughs> then we're near the top and then we're going to find something we're else. A little, a little, Perhaps a little bit more respected, I guess. <laughs> right, right. I, I would say, um, you know, I, I think the venture side is going to be negatively impacted, right? There's hundreds of venture funds and there's maybe 30 protocols that matter and maybe a dozen institutions that matter, the majority of which are TradFi. So I think on the venture side, there's still more of a reckoning that's going to happen. We talked about some of the knock-on effects from the DCG portfolio. Um, so that's something to to watch out for yeah cool uh closing question do you think another genesis gets built and gets yeah. to the level of scale or does this happen on chain it'll be both um another genesis will be built yes and it should not be built i think well <laughs> it, you can it will and should not be that's a it good will should not be. I, but if it's yeah. on chain proof of reserves or proof of whatever, yes. with some privacy components, you kind of mitigate a lot of this. Correct. Correct. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the, it's a really interesting question to say, like, how would you build Genesis on chain? Because Compound and Aave and Maker are not that. You need to, those are consumer apps. You need to make them institutional. Um, and that's a big lift, right? You need an app that can do a UCC filing. For instance, that's just one element. I've talked to Stani about this, by the way. And because the key feature that someone needs to build on chain is uh, delayed time lock liquidations. Because it's nice when Genesis can call you in March uh, of 2020 and say, hey guys, uh, you need to refill your collateral three times. We had, I had to refill collateral three times that day. Um, and in Aave, you get immediately liquidated and it's high gas. And I think you can build in a, 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 some logic at the smart contract level because I think a lot of funds appreciate that. And I think that would, it's not Good. perfect, but just that feature like that would kind of move the needle, I think. I agree. That, that's, that's another feature you need. I mean, there's a, there's a lot you have to do. For example, Genesis is financing Seoul, which do not have a deep liquid market. Right. So your eligible collateral, what you're lending against, has to be deep and liquid. You need to have the ability to integrate with... Uh, Bloomberg terminals, you know, there's something called like a fixed protocol where trades go through so TradFi can access it. You need a liquid loan market, meaning you can't be the only game in town. You know, in TradFi, you have corporate loans that are issued and we can't, the three of us can't buy those corporate loans off of Schwab. But those corporate loans do trade from one bank to another to the hedge funds over the counter and there's standards that enable that to happen. 
and the custody framework around that. You can custody on chain here, but look, this can be built on chain, but it's a multi-year effort that's required. It takes industry standards also. So does that make you a tokenization bull or skeptic? Yeah, I'm a big tokenization bull. I think tokenization is one of the promises of digital assets because what do banks and exchanges do? Banks and exchanges intermediate between two parties. One, they exchange value that's represented in a ticker, which is a pointer to a, a legal contract, which is a claim on assets and cash flows. And you can do all of that on chain. And if you look at the risks and the, the issues in the 2008 crisis, uh, a lot of that's centered around counterparty risk. Counterparties didn't trust each other. Counterparties have balance sheets with holes in them. Um, and, you know, digital assets, DeFi, blockchain, crypto. Transparent, 24-7, 365. Transparent, exactly. So, yeah, no, I'm, I, I agree. I think tokenization is an incredible opportunity. And certain chains like Ethereum, I think, should benefit from that. But also, you know, other chains like, like AVA, AVAX, maybe Stellar, et cetera, as well. Nice. Well, Ram, I, I will leave it there. I would love to bring you on down the road to talk about tokenization, maybe all, and, and applying that traditional finance yeah. lens. Uh, but it's been a real treat. Thank you so much for- uh, My pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you, bro. Yeah, thanks, Ram.